All right, so majority of the manure management stuff that's in this talk does come from Chapter 9, if you've had it or if you've downloaded it online on the nutrient management website. So some of these tables that are in there, some of the, the points are all from that, so you can read that chapter as a review of this. So just start off with, we'll see if this question works or not, just a review to see what you know. What are the primary macronutrients? Well, it is not answer number two. It is answer D. Calcium is a macronutrient, but is the secondary. So NPK, that's what's on your fertilizer bag. And we're going to talk about mainly NNP when we talk about manure management. Okay. So what are some of the benefits of manure that we know? Why do people even use it? Well, it reduces money spent on commercial fertilizer, particularly if you already have animals on your property and you can harness that manure because it does have nutrients. It has some value as well within its organic matter content and building soil quality, which helps water holding, it helps the structure, it helps drainage. There's all kinds of great things that come out of adding organic matter to soil. So it can reduce the money you spend on commercial fertilizer. What you will find as you do nutrient management is there are not enough nutrients in manure to apply all the nitrogen they need because there's often too much phosphorus. But you can add some, and then they'll just have to buy the rest of the commercial to make up for it. So it can reduce the um, energy spent in creating commercial fertilizer as well, because you know how at this point we get the nitrogen out of the atmosphere. So it improves the soil organic matter content. These are good points to remember about adding manure. Why? It's not just the nutrients. The cation exchange capacity, because organic matter in the soil, out of anything in there, clay, sand, silt, clay, clay sand, and silt, Organic matter will add the most CEC, the ability to hold all those nutrients that you need. So, because it has charge, it also improves water holding. It can stabilize your structure. If you've ever seen those soil tests where they drop a piece of soil in water that has a lot of organic matter, and you see it hold together a lot stronger. Think of organic matter almost like duct tape in the soil. It can wrap around and hold those particles together. And a soil with low organic matter as water moves into it, it forces air out and causes it to explode. We call it a slate test. It can also lower your bulk density because it creates more pore space. So it allows that water movement and it allows root movement. And it increases microbial activity. So there's all kinds of benefits from adding manure. There are also risks from manure application. We won't necessarily talk about this as much in this class, but there are possibly pathogens. If you've ever heard of good agricultural practices or You've seen some of these talks about salmonella that might be on some of our truck crops, like tomatoes and things like that, pink wheat. If you don't manage your manure, you might have things like that. It can have heavy metals. It's not always as likely as biosolids. It can have volatile organic compounds, and it could have pharmaceuticals or antibiotics. So there are some negative things to think about. They're outside of nutrient management. Application of manure may cause excess nutrients into our ground and surface water if it's not managed correctly. And that's why we're talking about this right now. If you understand the properties of manure, then you can help limit the excess nutrients that are going on our ground and surface water. There also can be some complaints about lower air quality because people don't always like the smell. Unless you grew up around, I grew up in a dairy farm, so I think that stuff smells like sugar. It's taken me about four or five years to get used to chicken litter, but I've finally gotten used to that. So there are benefits and risks. Manure and commercial fertilizer can both lose nutrients to the environment. Both of them can. So if someone tells you, I'm applying manure, and I'm talking sometimes with an organic farmers, farming circle, they think commercial fertilizers are all evil. But the nitrogen that's produced from manure can leach out of the soil just as easy as a commercial fertilizer. It might be slow release, what we'll talk about, but it can still be lost to the environment. You still have to manage it. So the speed of the loss is what we're talking about here. Commercial fertilizer can be immediately available for uptake. The nitrogen manure might have to be released over the spring as things warm up and the microbes get active. So in the manure equation, and when you are writing nutrient management plans and when you're talking to a farmer, you have to think about several things. First of all, production. How much manure is being produced depends on the type of animal you have and the age they are. The storage type. Where are they going to store it? And where it's stored also can change the properties of the manure over time. And then, in the end, land application. How much of that are you going to be allowed to apply 
within the regulatory environment, but also to get the nutrients that we want. So manure production and composition, page 208. If you're reading chapter 9, you can flip to that and take a look at it. So the quantity of manure produced, not all animals produce the same amount of manure. It could be very obvious if you talk about one chicken versus one beef, but even within the animal species, there can be difference. And you also have to think about the age of an animal. Because some people might have a herd of cattle, so they might have young and older animals. So you have to include all of that when you're thinking about manure. They're all going to produce a different amount. And then in land application, not all manures have the exact same nutrient content. Every animal might produce different amount of nutrients. Every year you might have a different amount of nutrients. This is why we require people to take a manure test before they apply it because of all the changes that can occur in manure over time. We have to make sure we know it's in there before we apply. 50% of the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that an animal uptake can pass right through them into the manure. So they're not very efficient in processing it. But we also have to think about bedding type and storage. We'll go into a little more detail. How is the manure being stored? The storage lagoon versus piled in the field can affect how that nitrogen is cycling, how those microbes are active. And then the bedding type, because you just talked a little bit about C to N ratio. Depending on the bedding you have, that C to N ratio can affect how that nitrogen is available. In those different so manure production by species, again, this is page 208. The quantity of manure, the amount produced amongst all these animals, can be different among species because of difference in animal diets and metabolism. So dairy versus poultry, very obviously one animal, one chicken, one dairy cow produce a different amount of manure. It's very obvious, it should be. But you can also have different production within species. It might depend on the diet, it might depend on their management, their eating habits, as well as their bedding and their feed source. You ever heard of phytase in chicken? Within chickens, we used phytase so they would hold more phosphorus in the poultry's body. So if one poultry farm is getting phytase and the other isn't, you would have different amounts of phosphorus in there. One animal unit, so this one AU, you'll see this in your book. It's very simple. It just means 1,000 pounds of live weight animal. Because every animal, every species, is going to weigh a different amount, we have to what we call normalize or standardize it so we can discuss animal units amongst um, different animal types. So this is table 9.1 on page 209. So one animal unit is 1,000 pounds. The way they set it in that table we'll go over is one beef cow is assumed to be 1,000 pounds. Does every beef cow weigh 1,000 pounds? No. But we have to have an assumption. When you guys do these calculations about how much manure is being produced on this farm, you're not going to go out on that farm and weigh every single animal going to change over time. So we have to have standardized units. So we have assumptions. One beef cow is going to weigh 1,000 pounds. For these tables we use in 209. But it takes 2.67 breeder hogs to also make 1,000 pounds. So one animal unit of beef cow is one cow, but one animal unit of, of these hogs is two and a half. Here's the table. So for every 1,000 pounds, this off. So one beef cow in this table is assumed to be 1,000 pounds. Dairy cow, 0.74. So dairy cow is assumed to weigh a little less. And then poultry down here, broilers, it takes 455 of them to make 1,000 pounds. That's going to vary by farm type, but when you're doing these type of calculations, we have to make assumptions to make it easy, to make it even. Remember, when we're doing nutrient management planning, when you're writing this plan, you're planning for the next year, two or three, it can change. They might lose all their broilers. They might have mortality. They might change out. They might sell out. When you're doing nutrient management planning, you're trying to project this is how much is going to be produced so we know how much we have. At the end of the year, we have the AIR, Annual Implementation Report, where farmers say what they actually did. But you guys are just planning this is how much could be produced. So, if one beef weighs 1,000 pounds, it's one animal unit. If one beef cow weighs 1,200 pounds, it would be 1.2 animal units. If it weighed less, it would be 0.9. Back in this table, we had the manure that was produced, 11.5, 15.24. So every one animal unit of beef cattle produces 11.5 tons of dairy manure. I'm sorry, beef. 
So you multiply the animal unit by the amount of manure produced to give you the total. So again, we don't have the weight of every single animal, so we're going to assume that all beef weigh the same. So instead, you'll do it by the number of animals. So this might be a calculation you get. How much manure is produced? 200 cow dairy. So if you have 200 cows, we know that every one animal unit is 0.74 dairy cows. Every one animal unit makes 15.24 tons of manure. Now, this is how I got through a lot of my college classes, is looking at these units. You want the units to cancel out. So if tons of manure is on the bottom here and you want it to be on at the answer, you want to flip it. You want dairy cows to cancel each other out. So one has to be on the top and one has to be on the bottom. If you think like that when you're writing out these equations, it's seriously, when you're struggling in an exam and you're stressed out, take the time to write out your units. Don't just write those numbers. Because you can see right here, I wrote it like this. As I wrote down my numbers, okay, one animal unit produces 15.24 tons of manure. But when I set up the equation, I realized manure has to be on top because that's our answer. And I needed dairy, 1AU to cancel out. Make sure your units are set up. Write them out. Don't just write the numbers. Because they might, when they set up these questions, they might flip some of these on purpose to give you the wrong answer. So just make sure you write out these answers. So you could do something like this one easily, but some of these questions are a little hard. And trust me, writing out these units will help you. So 15.24 divided by 0.74 times 200 cows, about 4,000 tons. So that's a simple calculation. So 1,000 pounds of chickens, cows, or hogs is also known as answer one. All right, so collection. When you're writing these plants, you're also going to have to discuss how are we collecting this manure. Understand that some animals are confined and some animals aren't. I'm on the Eastern Shore, Somerset County. 99% of what I deal with is chicken litter. More than likely, we have some free-range chickens. It's under roof. So all that manure is going to be collected, and we know that. Dairy, a pasture is going to be different. No one's going to go out there with something. Somebody says they did in Wicomico County that they went out and collect all their horse manure. It's fine. But you can actually say this isn't collected and isn't going to be land applied because it's out in the pasture. You have to know those differences. And, of course, a feedlot, if they never leave the lot, then all that manure has to be collected. Another way to think about it, because you might deal with this, is you might have what we call partial confinement. So in this dairy farm, for a time when they might be feeding or keeping out of the rain, the animals might be under this barn roof, and that's going to be collected. But out in the pasture, it's not. So you have to ask the farmer, how many days, how many hours a day are they under roof? One hour, two hours, three? 12, do you lock them in? Do you lock them in the winter? So you get an average of how much is going to be collected under that barn that then you're going to have to figure out what to do with. Is it going to be exported off the farm? Is it going to be land applied on another field where they're growing crops? Is it going to be land applied to their pasture? Versus if their beef cows are out on pasture all the time, then you have to, fit, you have to report how much manure is produced, but if it's applied to the farm directly to pasture, so it's not necessarily going to be restricted in what they can do with it. So manure under roof might be considered partial confinement. You have to ask them how many hours a day they're confined and then calculate the manure production. So you might have a calculation like this on the exam. I don't know. But if you're writing plans, we do have these nice, handy-dandy Excel worksheets that let you calculate all this out anyway. So in this case right here, we have full days confined, partially days confined, and we also consider the different animal sides. They might keep their calves under roof. So the, the size of that animal will say, okay, well, they produce a little less manure, but they're confined all the time. Beef cows, they bring them in for an hour a day, or horses. So there are spreadsheets out there to help you figure out the numbers of hours of day and manure production they do. But you have to consider this stuff. So once you know production, then your next question about manure is, what are they going to do with it? A lot of what we have down where I'm at on the shore is exported off the farm. They might export it to um, composting facilities, used to go to a pelletizing place for poultry litter, or they might go to other farms that have land. We also have what we call no-land plants, 
where all they have are chicken houses and no land to apply to, so they have to export. Will it be land applied? Right here is where you start to get your really tough calculations. If it's going to be land applied, you have to figure out what's the nutrient content of the manure, what crops are they growing, and how much are they allowed to put out based on the crop need and the regulations of the state. To me, the science always makes sense. It's the regulations I have to read a couple of times to make sure you're doing it right. So manure is usually managed to provide the three primary macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Of course, as you saw before, potassium is not really considered an environmental issue, so we're mainly concerned about nitrogen and phosphorus. And what's happened within the last 10 or 15 years is we've really put the pressure on phosphorus because these manures have more phosphorus in them than the crop needs. So unfortunately, when you come up with these applications of manure, you can only put out so much that the farmer needs. He might need 150 pounds of N for his corn, but based on the manure content of the regulations or what he's applied in the past or his soil properties, he might only be able to put about 60 or 80 pounds of the nitrogen from the manure and I have to make it <coughs> But this is still what you're interested in. They want this nitrogen. This phosphorus is going to limit how much they can apply. There are other things, and they're not, we're not concerned with them in regulations, but these secondary micronutrients, calcium, sulfur, boron, Magnesium, copper, molybdenum, iron, um, sodium, and zinc. All of these are important plant nutrients. So these are good benefits of manure. If you're other discussing with somebody why we want to make sure we allow some people to plant manure, that, that organic matter, but also some of these secondary micronutrients are going to be important. And if you have a farmer whose fields become restricted and he can't apply manure that year, he might not realize that he was getting all these micronutrients. So as a nutrient management advisor, it's not just NNP you're concerned about, but you can also give them good advice and say, hey, you know, this year you're not getting your manure, next couple of years maybe, or maybe their field is restricted forever. If it's over um, FIV 500, they can't apply manure at all because of the phosphorus in it. And to those guys, you'll look a lot smarter as a nutrient management advisor if you can talk about those micronutrients and those secondary nutrients. Say, hey, you know what? You might need, um, well, this one should be manganese, not magnesium put two magnesiums aside. You might need some manganese this year because you haven't been able to apply that manure. You might have been getting some zinc out of it. So remember those things. Not regulated, but still important as a nutrient management provider. Because of the variation in nutrient contents, we typically require, at least within extension, we tell people you can't give us a manure sample for land application until after Thanksgiving. That's what we do with an extension. I don't know if that's a state regulation, but I know Trish likes it that way. So after Thanksgiving, they can take a manure sample because they're going to be applying probably in March, and over the winter time, there's not going to be enough activity to really reduce that nitrogen content, which is what we're going to get into now. So the nutrient content of manures, again, this is page 209, it's going to vary. So it's not just how much they produce, but every animal has a different amount of NP and K. Some people might tell you that horse has no value as a nutrient. It does. It's just lower. It's much lower than other animals. Sometimes on the shore, people try to say, well, you can't get much out of horse. You can't get as much. It's like one-third of what you would get from chickens in the nitrogen. But it's there. It's just not as accessible. So broiler, turkey, layer, swine, and dairy, they all have a different amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So that's going to affect how much you can apply from these different animal types. And here's something else. Remember, I talked about those units. Pay attention. Pounds per ton. This is telling you that all this stuff's dry weight. Pounds per 1,000 gallons, so it's in one of those liquid storage things. Again, those units are important. When you're doing the math, and you can ask the math question, pay attention to what those units are. So pounds of P205 per ton, pounds of P205 per 1,000 gallons. But on the exam, you're not going to have to guess this. They're going to give you a value. They're not going to say, hey, how much nitrogen is in chicken liver, OK? They should not do that to you. <laughs> um, so you also can have a variation. So this is poultry litter, minimum, maximum, and mean. Moisture content ranges from 2 to 47%, depending on how long it was laid out, were they wind growing it. The average, 23. Look at that nitrogen, 22 to 98 pounds per ton. That's why we tell people to sample before you're going to land apply. Because it's not just the regulatory environment. It's also making sure they get as much nutrient as they can. If they give you a sample and their nitrogen content lowered 
after they gave you that sample, when they apply it, they're going to be putting out a lot less nitrogen than they need. So taking that sample as close to application time as possible is beneficial for both the environment and the farmer. But I've seen a lot of variation in different chicken litters that come in. And part of it has to do with diet manipulation, where they feed them grains, legumes, where they grass fed, uh, where they using phytates, increases phosphorus retention by poultry. So it was great at lowering the amount of phosphorus in manure over time. Most poultry houses do this, but not everyone might. Again, that's another reason we just sample and take a test. You don't guess. Go ahead and take a test. This table is also in your book, and it's just to point out that not only does N, P, and K vary, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, all of those vary in manures as well. So just know that they vary, that everyone might be getting a different amount of these different micro and secondary nutrients. So all animal manures have the exact same nutrient content. I assume you all put false. So so not only do these manures have a different amount of nutrients, how they are stored and handled is going to change that content. So you have to understand this in terms of maybe doing a calculation on the exam. But again, when you're writing a plan, they're going to take a sample before they apply so they know what happened. But they should understand that those contents change. And this can help you discuss with them why they need to take that sample closer to um, application time. Nutrient loss can occur in any type of storage. It doesn't matter whether it's dry, it doesn't matter whether it's a wet lagoon like this hog lagoon. It can occur in any of those, but it can be slightly different. It varies based on whether it was wet or dry storage type and the bedding that was mixed with. So one way that you can lose nutrients is if you have a lagoon that's solids and liquids, the solids can settle to the bottom. Now in a lot of cases, the solids carry a lot of the phosphorus and the potassium. Now any good farmer or manure applicator is going to agitate that lagoon to mix it back up. But with, when they took a sample, they were lazy that day and only took it up from here, that rainfall could have diluted it, the soluble settling out could have diluted it. So they might have a very high nitrogen, but a low phosphorus and potassium content. So settling of solids can change the nutrient content. It didn't necessarily go anywhere in this case if they agitate properly, but poor sampling techniques can mess with your numbers. A very important way of losing particularly nitrogen are gaseous losses. So in our lagoons right here, gaseous nitrogen losses occur in wet and dry storage, particularly in these wet. So you can have nitrate inside of this lagoon, and you saw that picture of denitrification in the cornfield. Nitrate in a lagoon like this Especially the deeper down you get, there's going to be very low to zero oxygen in that environment. And when that happens, those microbes are going to turn to nitrate. That's their electron receiver. When they're eating on all that carbon and all that manure down here, and they're going to turn it into nitrogen gas. So over time, in these storage environments, we lose nitrogen. Also, ammonium can become ammonia and go off as a gas. So in storage, you can lose nitrogen as gas. You can also lose it in dry storage, most of the time as ammonia. So ammonium is released first, mineralization, we'll talk about that in a second. If you lose that extra hydrogen, it can go off as ammonia. So manures that are sitting around for a while, storage of chicken litter, you can lose that over time. You can almost even be composting itself. So everybody that manages their chicken litter differently, they might windrow it in the house, they might store it under a shed. They might not use it for a while. There's another reason to not only take that sample right before production, but take a good sample. Because it's going to vary throughout the profile of that pile, and it's going to vary throughout this manure lagoon. So just double checking. I know you guys have had some of this. Let's see what you know. The molecular formula for ammonia, this is important. You need to recognize the difference between these nitrogen species. Because if you're reading these questions and you don't know the differences, C is ammonia. All right, I got them all up here. You should start to get them right as we go through them. The molecular formula for ammonium. All right, it is answer two, B. That's ammonium. So ammonia, 
That's the gas form. That has a three. Ammonium has the additional hydrogen. It's not a gas. It can attach to soil particles. It's not lost as easily. It's NH4. So now you know it's not these two. Which one's nitrate? All right, nitrate was A, NO3. I don't think I put the last one. This one's dinitrogen gas. This is what you're breathing right now. It's N2. So if you got those wrong, it lets you know you need to study up on those. Make sure you know them and the transformations in the cycle. The nitrogen cycle is the most difficult because it can become so many different species within the soil and nor organic matter and fertilizers that you add and biocides all can have nitrogen cycles. So this is a simplified version. From manure, you can lose, through volatilization, if there is any ammonia, NH3, it can go off as a gas. When it mineralizes, when the organic form of nitrogen becomes a mineral form, it becomes ammonium first, it can lose that hydrogen and become ammonium and be lost as a gas. It can also nitrify into nitrate. Remember, these are your two plant available forms. See that? If you have cation exchange capacity in your soil, right? It has soil, can hold on to cations. So it can hold on to ammonium. It can't hold on to nitrate, so nitrate leaches. Soils are negative, nitrate's negative, it leaches through. If you have a saturated environment, like deep down in that hog lagoon, you might have denitrification where it gets turned back into um, dinitrogen gas. And then you can also have a mobilization, which is could be microbes, weeds, or even a crop. It's pulling that mineral form, these minerals, back into an organic form. So most loss within manure storage is going to be from nitrogen. If you lose phosphorus and potassium, it's probably because they either settled out with a solid or it was lost with erosion or with wind or ran out of there. Most of your loss is because nitrogen be can become a gas and it can leave these systems as a gas. So you see a liquid lagoon, you can have 70 to 85 percent loss of nitrogen over time versus some of these dry systems which are a little lower. And all of this loss here from phosphorus and potassium is mainly due to how it was handled. And in this case, the 30 to 80 percent loss in this lagoon, it was deposited on the bottom. It just needs to be agitated and brought back to the surface. So most of the loss we're going to talk about is from that nitrogen transformation. So phosphorus and potassium in manure storage, relatively low loss. Um, most losses are due to handling. It can be loss of liquid or solid runoff, wind-blown dust. Um, and losses are due to settling a solid. That's where most of that loss comes from. So that can be pretty simple to remember. It's that nitrogen cycle, which obviously is going to give you guys a little problem. This is where you need to understand not only just the species, but what's the difference between organic nitrogen and mineral nitrogen. So organic nitrogen is a fraction in dead plant or animal material. So it's found primarily in amine groups, amino acids. Right? The nitrogen in your body, in your cellular structures, is organic. It has to be broken down and released by microbes to become these mineral forms. Amino acids, nitrate, and ammonia. Plants uptake those mineral forms, so it's important to know these. So ammonium and nitrate are the two primarily forms of nitrogen that plants uptake. This one is held in the soil on the CEC. It doesn't stick around very long, though. It becomes nitrate very easily. Nitrate can leach through your soil. So that's a problem with manure management and timing of manure application. The most common form of inorganic N in manure is often ammonia because it's being broken down first. That's what's released. When you mineralize mineralization, you take organic nitrogen and turn it into a mineral form. That one's easy to remember. Ammonium is what comes out first. The carbon to nitrogen ratio becomes very important in storage and bedding because it can affect how much of that nitrogen is going to be available and what happens to it. If the C to N ratio, and they, it ranges from 20 to 30, the number they're using more often now is 20. A C to N ratio means how many parts carbon to nitrogen. So a C to N of 20 means you have 20 times more carbon than nitrogen. That's 20 divided by 1, 20 over 1. The problem with microbes is just like us, they need a range of nutrients. 
So if you stick something out there that has a whole lot of carbon, well, they want to eat that carbon for their energy. But there's also nitrogen in there they need. They're going to take all the nitrogen they can, and if there's not enough nitrogen here to help break down this carbon, they're going to steal it from your manure or your soil. That's why C to N ratio is important in the material add to the soil. Because if there's not enough nitrogen in the material for them to eat, they're going to steal it from wherever they can. So if you look over here, if you go below 20, that means you have less and less carbon, so you have plenty of nitrogen. And in fact, if you have plenty of nitrogen, if half of this was nitrogen, then there's enough nitrogen there that they eat what they want and they release the rest and your plant can uptake it. So that's the important thing about C to N ratio. And it affects manures because we use different beddings. So if you bed with alfalfa hay, well, it has a C to N of 12 to 1. That's below 20. So alfalfa is going to release nitrogen anyway. So if you mix it with manure, you're going to have plenty of nitrogen. If you add sawdust, which has a ratio to 300 to 1, that means your nitrogen is going to be immobilized. Those microbes are going to pull it up. It doesn't necessarily go anywhere. But during the growing season is when your microbes are active. So if they're alive, they're going to be holding on to the nitrogen that your plant needs. But in the winter, as those microbes die, they're going to re-release it and come back out. So the bedding of these materials, which is also, you're not going to go out and test all of this, but you take that manure sample. No matter what they bed with, you take a manure sample so you know what's in there. So this is a table um, out of chapter 9. Looks a little uh, more complicated than it needs to be because phosphor and potassium are mainly out of storage. But this lets you know in each storage type how much nitrogen you could expect to lose. So for an open lot or a feed lot, it's about 50%. In a slurry manure, a, a lagoon, it's about 85%. So they're saying you store in that lagoon, you're more likely to lose it as a gas. So you can have these factors like that of loss in storage. Again, you don't have to memorize these. If, if someone's giving you a question about how much is lost in storage, you want to go to a table value. So you can see on phosphorus and potassium, it's times one. So you're not losing unless anaerobic digestion, these anaerobic lagoons, you're probably not going to fool with those too much, but you might. You can lose a little bit in that, and that's because the solids are left behind in an anaerobic digester. So it's not going anywhere. Not like um, nitrogen. Most of that loss is from it being a gas. So there can be nutrient loss during storage, which is why we tell everyone to take a sample. And availability and loss is also important during application. And this comes back to incorporation. So if you can lose nitrogen as a gas during storage, you can lose it when you apply it to the soil. So we tell people to incorporate it because it puts that ammonium down into the soil where even if it becomes ammonia, it has a harder time volatilizing and maybe the plant can take it up before it's lost. So again, just review these. Organic N, it's those amino acids that are bonded, part of that organic structure. The inorganic stuff is ammonium and nitrate. You can get a soil test, and this is another thing you'll need to understand. All these different forms of nitrogen you might be given in a question. Organic N. So that's all of the nitrogen that's in an organic form. Ammonium and nitrate, those are, those are your two mineral forms. So if you get a, a test of your manure sample, this is the amount of organic nitrogen they found, these are the mineral forms, and then they have the total nitrogen that was in there. Understanding all those other differences, when you get a question when you're talking to farmers, you want to understand these differences. Mineral, organic, and total because you might get a question. If you want to figure out how much is, or, how much is organic and they, all they give you is total N and nitrate, you would subtract nitrate from total N and say the rest was organic. So they might give you a total N and have to figure out how much is mineral. They might give you total N and say how much is organic. So just understand those differences. So the inorganic fraction can range from 20 to 65% of total nitrogen. Nitrate, ammonium, it's immediately available to plants. So any of this right here, the ammonium and nitrate, this analysis, if they apply that manure, your plants can immediately take that up. This organic stuff 
has to be broken down and released through mineralization. So organic N fraction must be converted to inorganic N through mineralization, turning it into a mineral form. And it's highly variable and influenced by factors such as temperature, moisture, and C to N ratio of the manure. This is why we let people that do manure application do a pre side dress nitrate test. Because if you put out manure in March, and maybe it warmed up for two weeks too much, you might have had more nitrogen mineralized into ammonium and then become nitrate and then leach out before the corn could get access. So we allow people to go out later in the season with manure application to do a test in the soil to make sure there's enough nitrate available for their crop uptake. That's the problem with manure application. If you put out a commercial fertilizer, you know it's available immediately with manure because temperature, moisture, and C to N ratio can vary with how much is available. We allow people that do manure application to do another test when corn is, say, about six inches tall and up, they can start to do a test to say how much nitrogen is available in their soil. We don't do that for commercial fertilizers because if you manage that correctly, it's available when you put it out. So mineralization, again, is a release. These amino acids turn into an inorganic form, like a moon, something that the plant can update. So understand mineralization. The nice thing about a question like this and about mineralization is we can talk about the soil organic matter, manure, biosolids. These concepts are going to keep coming back today and tomorrow. They apply to all of this because it's part of the nitrogen cycle where we find nitrogen. So at 20 to 1, anything below 20 is going to release nitrogen. Anything above 20 is going to immobilize it. That means that those microbes are like, there's not enough nitrogen in this material. I'm going to steal it from your soil or your manure. So if you see someone adding, why is manure a great nutrient source? Well, 20 to 1 or lower, it's going to release nitrogen. Someone says, well, I'm going to add straw to my soil as an organic matter source and nutrient source, well, you see that 75 to 1, you'll know as an advisor, you're like, that's not such a good idea because it's going to immobilize any nitrogen in your soil immediately. On the other hand, um, about 10, 20 years ago, there was a field in South Carolina where they put down too much nitrogen, so they applied straw immediately to try to hold it in place so it wouldn't leach out. So there are different ways to deal with that. So because your manure is variable in how much it releases over time. Because it mineralizes, we have these factors, these mineralization rates. And this is, some, this is a question you probably will get on the exam, doing a calculation like this. What this table says is the cattle, in the first year of application in cattle manure, 35% of the organic nitrogen is released and available. But because it doesn't all happen at once, there's some in the second year, or the year after, and the second year after application. So one, two, and third year. So this is why we keep track and we give the nitrogen credits over a couple years with manure, because the microbes have to break down and release this nitrogen out of these organic structures. It takes some time. You can see with layer chickens, 60% is available the first year. Horses, only 20%. So not only do horses have a low amount of nitrogen, not a lot of it's available up front. This is why people think it's not a great nutrient source. It's there, there's not a lot, and it's not immediately available. So these layers release, release a lot more. So you might get a question that says, how much was released this year in the growing season versus the next year? So you just have to know if I have this much organic nitrogen, 60% is available the first year, but I'll still get a benefit a little bit the next year. So if you have, someone says you have um, organic nitrogen, year 0, 1, and 2, 20 pounds per ton of organic N of poultry litter. The first year, mineralization rate, 6, so 12 pounds would be available. 3 in the second year and 1.6 1, 1. in year 3 or 2 years later. So you always get some over time. So pay attention to that. Know that most of it's available up front, but it's going to keep on giving the next year or two. And that's why we have manure credits and even legume credits. We talk about, I'm sure you talk about legumes, about how much nitrogen is going to be available in um, the years after that. 
So nitrate and ammonium are both A, inorganic forms of nitrogen, or B, organic forms of nitrogen. All right, the answer is A. They are both inorganic, which is mineral, inorganic. An organic form would be an amino acid, it would be the nitrogen that's locked up in the mineral. So this is where we talk about plant available nitrogen. It's another section in the chapter, but it's all related to what we've talked about before. How much nitrogen is going to be plant available? So basically you sum the inorganic nitrogen in that soil test, the ammonium and the nitrate in the manure test. That's your inorganic. It's immediately available. And then you take the percent of organic nitrogen that will be available, say, that year. So PAN question about PAN, that just means plant available nitrogen. So you take the two concepts we talked about, inorganic and organic, you add them together to figure out how much is going to be available this year. So that release of inorganic nitrogen, two major pathways um, for loss of nitrogen in manure. Volatilization is a loss of ammonia gas, it's NH3. We also have a loss of ammonium to ammonia and then a conversion of urea to ammonia. So urea is a commercial fertilizer, so when you talk about commercial fertilizers, we can also lose it as a gas. So urea is a nitrogen-containing compound that is readily converted to ammonia um, with the enzyme urease and produces ammonia, which is the gaseous form of the loss of the gas. So you can cross over with manures and commercial fertilizers. A lot of these same processes happen in both places. So PAN is the available ammonium and the available organic N. So the available ammonium is going to be related to a conservation factor. Because you can lose it as this gas, we have to know how much is conserved. And that's why we start talking about incorporation. If you incorporate within the first day, you assume a lot more is going to be in that soil versus if you don't incorporate it all. And manure sitting on the surface over time, it's going to become ammonia and be lost. So when you do plant available nitrogen, there's two calculations. You figure out how much ammonium is going to remain based on the practices and the management, and how much of that organic is going to be mineralized and released by microbes. So you got two factors. Ammonium times the conservation factor and organic N times the mineralization factor. So the mineralization is the release. It's that table you saw before. 60% is available the first year, 50% is available the next. The conservation factor is usually tied to tillage. So that's the mineralization table again. It's the same table I showed you before. But the conservation is going to be related to when did you incorporate it? If you incorporate it within one hour in conventional tillage, we assume that 96% of that ammonium is remaining for crop uptake. If you wait greater than three days, at that point, we just say, well, only 35% of it is going to be left, that a lot more of it is going to be lost as a gap. So again, understand this table for doing calculations, but you should be given these factors. You should be given a fact. You just have to recognize what's the difference between a mineralization of organic N and the conservation of ammonium. Ammonium can be lost as a gas, so we talk about incorporating it. So that's conservation. Mineralization is release of organic nitrogen. So calculating PAN, you might be given a question that says, the lab test shows cow manure has 16 pounds per ton N organic. To organic nitrogen, so that should tell you immediately that has to be mineralized to be available to plants, and 12 pounds per ton of ammonium. So that ammonium is an inorganic form, it's a mineral form, it's immediately available to your plants. But the problem is it can become a gas and be lost. So 12 pounds per ton of the ammonium times a conservation factor of, I'm sorry, I didn't read this part. Conservation tillage manure is injected within 6 to 12 hours. So 6 to 12 hours, conservation tillage, 0.53. So 50% of your ammonium will be remaining and 0.35 the first year for the organic. And that's how you would calculate PAN. So these calculations, you can go by this one as your study, and you can also go look in the book and read that to, to practice these calculations. 
So not only do you have to worry about how much nitrogen is available, is the ammonium going to be conserved, what, how much is going to be mineralized, the animal type, how many days to incorporation, all those different factors, then you have to figure out how much is my manure spreader going to put out? And how do you calculate the rate of application? So you can know the nitrogen content, you can figure out how much is going to be available, and then you have to figure out, well, what rate is he going to put it out? So you might have to um, work with spreading equipment some. So spreading equipment, it's a broadcast application of fertilizer, manure, lime, and seed. It's supposed to have an even distribution of crop inputs. It depends on um, the properties of the manure, if it's chunky or not. Um, accuracy is driven uh, by ground-driven conveyors. The width of the spreader, um, you can figure out via visual reference, compass, strips, crop rows, wheel turning techniques, different things like that. What you guys are going to have to do is calculate and calibrate possibly these different manure spreaders. And there are several ways to do it. And the questions you might get, you just have to understand what you're trying to get to. It's weight over area, right? How many tons of manure am I getting over an acre? So you have to go back and say, I'm trying to get to weight over area. So this is, again, it's all from your book. Um, you don't have to, obviously, write any of this down. But you can read this stuff exactly out of chapter 9. There are several ways to calibrate and figure out how much manure is being put out by a spreader. There's the tarp method. You place a tarp flat on the field, spread manure on the tarp, weigh the manure, and calculate the application rate. Repeat the measurement three times. There should be detail right after this slide. Swath and distance method. You figure out what's the width of that manure you spread on the field and how far they drove to empty an entire manure spreader. You do that three times. And then there is the least accurate method, the loads per field method. Someone says, I have a 100-acre field, and they spread manure across until they're done, and they say, OK, I put out 10 loads of manure on that. You take a, the load of the manure spreader and divide it by the acreage. So the problem with this is, by the time you get done with that field, you might figure out that you were over or under. So these TARP methods are more accurate about figuring out how much are you putting out um, to begin with? So your questions obviously are gonna you're gonna have to figure out weight and and area. So starting with the tarp, you get a tarp question. The tarp method, you place a tarp on the ground, you run the manure spreader across it, pick up that tarp and weigh it. You have the area, right? You measure the area, length and width of that tarp. You take the weight, you do that five times to get a good average, and you know if it puts that much on a tarp, then you transfer it up two acres. So they might not give you it, they should, but I think it's 43,560 feet squared per acre. So if you have a tarp that's 10 by 10 feet, it's 100 feet squared, just transfer that up to acres. That one's simple. You're just taking a weight and dividing it by area. They have some quick charts that if you have um, these tarp dimensions, 6 by 6 or 10 by 10, and you have these pounds of weight, your application rate in tons per acre, 0. 0.6 to 3.63. So there are some quick tables. Maybe they give you the quick table to look at. More than likely, you have to do the calculation yourself. Um, so you take an 8, eight foot by 8 foot tarp. You collect 8.8 .8 pounds of manure on the tarp. Again, always write out those units so that you put everything in the right place. 8.8 .8 pounds divided by 64 square feet. 8 by 8 foot tarp is 0.1375 pounds per square feet. And conversion factor they had back there, 21.78 is a quick conversion factor. gives you three tons per acre. But that's all that's going to include is um, the 43.56 and other factors. This math isn't too hard doing these application rates. The hardest part about it is understanding what the question says. You're trying to figure out weight over area. Understand what area is. Look at that question. Find the length. Find the width. They're talking about the distance that's driven. They might put the number in two different parts of the paragraph. Your width 
and then how long they drove would be the swap method. So in this case, they determine the weight of a load of manure in the spreader. The problem with this, obviously, you might not fill manure in the spreader up the same way, but obviously, if you have a question on the exam, it can be just one weight. This manure spreader holds a certain amount. They drove um, 100 feet, and it had a width of 10 feet. It's weight over area. It's another easy one to figure out. So in this case, they have a manure spreader that holds 7,000 pounds of manure, 3.5 tons. Application width, 35 feet. The equipment travels 1,200 feet. So 42,000 square feet, 35 by 1,200. 7,000 pounds divided by that, multiplied by that quick conversion factor they have. And you apply 3.63 tons per acre using that. And then the loads per field method, he basically tells you, well, I put 35 loads across the field, and he'd have to give you the acreage. Your field is 55 acres. Every manure spreader weighs 3.5, has 3.5 tons of manure in it. So 35 times 3.5 divided by 55 acres. It's easy to calculate, but in real life, this one isn't the most accurate because at this point, you've already put out the manure. What if you wanted three tons? Well, you put out two tons across that whole field. So the major drawback of the loads for field method, it's an after-the-fact calculation. That's the problem. But still, it's a way um, that some people might do. So the transformation of organic nitrogen into a mineral in organic form is known as you're taking organic nitrogen and turning it into a mineral form. All right, 95% mineralization. I did try to make it easy. Mineral form. Good. You got that? You're on your way to at least understanding some of the differences. Are there any questions? I know no, there is. Any